Good night, everyone. As you might have guessed, we, we, we have some international crowd. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> so sorry for the little uh, delay. So now we are already. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, let uh, Xavier Durand uh, tell you about everything you want to know about uh, continuous city measurement air core and. Uh, after that, you'll be able to ask some uh, questions. We do a Q&A session where you'll be able to ask all your questions regarding continuous integration, air core, all types of things, etc. So, I'll let you the mic. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. So, I'm going to try to do it in, in English. Uh, sometimes I may do it in French. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, first of all, I've got some questions for you. Um, is there any people from Le Wagon, from this batch today, or maybe they are still working? Yeah, yeah maybe. Because your demo day is like tomorrow, right? Okay, Le Wagon. I'm sorry for the bitch, just be focused. Um, is there any people working in startup or in the crowd? Yeah, cool, that's a lot. Um, and is there any people who want to build their own company, like as a CEO or CEO? You want to do it? Okay. We'll go ahead. Uh, who knows uh, how to do a continuous integration in the, in the crowd? Okay, cool. I'm going to try to teach you something and teach you my how to, how to do it, how we do it, as I hope. Yeah? And last question who knows who, uh, about Alco already? Who already? Who? Who? That's great. So nice to meet you, I'm Teddy Durand. I'm a tech founder of Erco, I'm 25 years old. Um, you have to know that Erco is my first work experience. Uh, I've never worked at any other company before. I um, started Erco like three years ago. Now we are 50 people. Um, and I really want to share with you guys uh, what's uh, the real life in a startup, in a French startup, going to see the US and then going back to France. So I'm going first, uh, going to talk about uh, how we went from four to fifty people at that point. Uh, then how the engineering team works daily, and then we're going to talk about the continuous integration, the main subject of tonight. So if you have any question, please uh, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Cool. So. Um, what I really want to learn you tonight, or to teach you tonight, is um, what Echo is and what's the main point of the story of it. Okay? So, for those who don't know Echo, uh, we are building a phone system for companies. We are just providing some numbers of company, and they can start making and receiving some calls uh, through these numbers. We integrated with a lot of CRM, like I don't know if you guys know Salesforce, uh, Slack, Intercom, and stuff. Uh, but we really want to crash all those all black Cisco phones who are on the desk of everyone. Uh, our main uh, customers are like maybe you know Deliveroo, Uber, Sidkick, uh, Vice, maybe Adormi, which is a big big uh, customer in the US. Uh, so that's kind of customer who's using a call for all their customer support or maybe the sales team. Okay. Do you guys have any questions so far, or can we start doing the pitch? Everyone, it's good. Cool. So I'm a guy from uh, French startup, so I want to make some catch phrases like that. So how we went from 400 dollars to 50 to plus people in less than three years. Um, this is pretty much like better. I think you see. Uh, first, we started um, at eFounders. So, actually, eFounders is just a startup studio. Uh, they have an ID in SaaS match. Uh, and they want to build a company with it. So, they're going to engage, they're going to find like four people, four guys, maybe girls, but, uh, to build this company. So, there are going to be some tech guys and some business guys. Then, then go, they're going to help them build the products. From one year, one year, one year and a half, uh, and just like 
in those builds and scale the products. So we went through this uh, like incubator program, which is the founders, and they made very great companies. You may know maybe Meljet, Textmaster mentioned France, Alco, Israel, and the Forest Spenders. You have to know that like three of these companies uh, made a US accelerator, two of them are made YC. Uh, you may know YC, Wake Up Manager, which is the mostly famous competitor of the US. So then, in, <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, at the end of 2013, they started up. So it was like four years ago. And we've been in eFounders for one year and a half. They really helped us build the first products and have our first fundraising. Okay? So in June 2015, we raised a really small amount of money for even by the startups. Uh, nearly one million dollar. Um, we had a really small product at this time, we were only four. Um, we could just make some calls and receive some calls. Uh, but with that, we already uh, succeeded to f uh, raise some money. That's something our first investor said about us, that we are underdogs. Um, actually, this is something really fun to hear about because uh, when something, someone told you that you are an underdog, you're not really smart, it's a huge pain for you. But actually, look at us right now, we are 50 people, we have offices in New York and Paris, it's really cool. And yeah, I think this kind of sentence just define how our call works and how the team works daily. So this is really something important for us, that everyone at Aircall is an underdog. We're not really smart. Maybe some more, <laughs> some, some people of Aircall are really smart, but I'm definitely not. And we are just underdogs. We just want to build something really cool, and we're going to do it. Then, uh, in June, we asked for 500 startups, um, Techstar and AngelPad to go into their program. Uh, that's three incubators, accelerators, sorry. Uh, all of them uh, wanted us for going into, into this program. And we choose 500 startup, which is in San Francisco, in the very heart of San Francisco. It's a four month program, uh, which is quite intense. You, you may know, you may remember. Uh, we were in batch 14. Uh, it started in July and it ends in November. That was really great. And if you want to know what is really 500 startup, you may remember Marvin, who say like it's Chinese buffet. You have all the resources you want. There is marketing guys, there is networking guys, growth guys, mentorship guys. You have all the best resources of San Francisco and of Silicon Valley just for you. But if you don't want to take it, they won't come to you. So you are ready to work, work, and work. That's what we had done for four months. And we really just worked for four months in San Francisco. We were like burned down like once or twice. But it was really, really cool. We went to San Francisco with our cool product. We thought we had a cool product because we just made the first fundraising. Um, we went to San Francisco. We show our product to some other startups. And they were like, OK, that's cool, but that's not really good. We were like, OK, shit. Our product is just, just not built for US markets, really. Then um, what is really good at 500 is that um, there is a lot of meetup, a lot of very cool guys uh, and girls coming and just talking about their experience. And there was, I remember there is like uh, this guy who is only 23, I, I think, who told us about his experience in startup. He was like, I'm 23 and I just raised $20 million of my company and I just sell it. I was like, okay, I'm 25 and just, I'm just shit. I don't know, just a French guy who just worked for three, two years in this company, and we've made nothing, actually, we've made nothing. This company just had one year old. Um, 500 Startup was really cool for us because we had a great, great network uh, of fundraising guy, investors and stuff, uh, so we could just start to do another fundraise because we wanted another round of money. 
And what's really cool is that TechCrunch one day called us and just told us, hey guys, you've just uh, been selected to go into TechCrunch Disrupt. Uh, there is like 1,000 companies, startups, who want to go to TechCrunch Disrupt. I don't know if you guys have seen the, um, the, web show, the TV show Silicon Valley, but it's quite famous. Um, in the first season, they won, I'm sorry for the spoiler, they won uh, TechCrunch Disrupt. We didn't, we lose, because we're on the dogs, but we don't care. We're part of like these 20 startups who went pitching at TechCrunch for free, and it's really expensive. So we went for free, that's really cool. And there is a lot, lot of investors and really good guys on Silicon Valley going to TechCrunch Disrupt every year in San Francisco. So when we knew that, um, when we knew that uh, we were selected, we were taken for going to TechCrunch, we were like, okay, we've built this product, this new product for four months in San Francisco. I think the, you get like a stem, I don't know how to say that, but yeah, it's validated by the Silicon Valley. So that was really good for, uh, for us. Um, we went back to France in November, uh, and then we raised about $3 million uh, for the US, it's not, a lot, but in France, it's quite good. Uh, and with this $3 million, we just went from four people to 20 people. And that was really awesome. We had a, a, mantra, a mantra, which is like celebrate every win. Um, every time you like just have a new customer, you have to take a beer. Every time you're shipping a new feature, you're gonna take a beer because life in startups it's so hard, you have so much pain to do it, that every time you're going to win something, you have to celebrate it. The first real party was like the three million party. We were maybe 12 people, and it was really, really good. We just celebrated everything that night. It was really cool. So with this uh, three million dollar, we have our first really core team, uh, like 20 people, one, who 20, 100 dogs people who wants just to build the new products really are really hungry about that and uh, much of them are French entrepreneurs which are really cool uh, and we get our first offices in Paris uh, maybe some of you just went in our offices they are really cool uh, so that was the first round the second round actually and then in September so uh, nine months later we raised about eight million. One sir. sir. Um, eight million again for the U.S. market is not much, but in France it's quite cool. Uh, it was our Series A, uh, and with that money we went from twenty to fifty people, and then we went to the U.S. market because we already knew that the U.S. market was really hard to get and. Then we've built the product for that. So with this money, we went to, 50, to 20 to 50 people. Uh, we just started to install some processes. Some how to, how do you handle a team from 20 to 50 people? It's not the same thing uh, when you handle a, a 50 people team as when you handle a 20 people team. Uh, so that's with all this money, it's been like 11 million dollar in less than two years, so that's cool. Do you guys have any question about our story? Is that pretty much clear? Or? I think we're good, cool. So now I'm going to talk about the engineering team and how do we work um, daily. Uh, first is our interview process. It didn't change uh, during those three years because it's working very, very well. Uh, we've been two at the really beginning of our call. Now we are like 20 people working for the tech, for the products at our call. Uh, the first step is the screening uh, session. So we just go on LinkedIn, we just go on platform like Hired or Talents in French or Urban. And then we're trying to find some really, really cool products and uh, profiles, sorry. Uh, <laughs> product. Once you got. Um, the, the good guy you want to work with, um, you just call him and just make like a 20 minute calls where you just show what Hercule does and 
um, he shows what he want to do, and you have to see if there is a match between together. If there is a match, then you have to make it come to um, the offices and make him doing like a tech interview. Um, one thing I want to share with you is maybe the best question we can ask in the tech interview process is that we really want our tech guys to be maybe business guys as well. So we're asking them, what's the difference for you between an API and Webhooks in the biz uh, terms? So it's a really easy question, but all the nerdy guys will suck at it. Yeah, it's really funny. And all those guys who did answer that question very well, we just ejected. Really, that's really funny. It's an easy question, but it's really hard to answer about it. Um, then once uh, they've made up to the tech interview, we're asking them to do a small, real small project, tech project for, you can go on our GitHub, and we have like four different projects. We got an integration HTML, CSS, very basic project. Uh, we got a front-end AngularJS project. We got another Ruby on Rails project. And we got um, a DevOps project as well for all those kind of different profile we want to recruit. Uh, all those projects, uh, if you're good, you can do it in like two hours. If you're not that good, you're doing it in six hours. Um, some of the developers who want to work with us try to do it, and they're doing it in six hours, and they are like, okay, I'm just doing it in six hours. I'm not really good. I'm done, I'm done with this company. Um, once you've met the tech project, you're doing a Skype interview with us, and you're just explaining how did you code and why did you code like that, and we just want to see if uh, we want to, we understand what you're saying with to us, and um, and yeah, if your code is quite clear, that's it. And the funniest part is the last one, the team lunch, when you've been selected to be working at Oracle, we want to make sure that. Um, that your profile match with everyone at the company and uh, that you want to really work with us. So you have to lunch with us one day and you'll see like 40 people in the very heart of Paris offices. Um, just have a lunch together, making some food together. That's really great. So, so you can understand the, how Hercule works and what's the, the, the um, spirit, Hercule spirit, sorry. So, with this um, tech interview, uh, we've built like different teams. We have a backend team, we have front-end team. We have a SQL lover, which is, which is our, uh, who is our uh, data analyst. We've got some mobile, we've got a DevOps, we've got a design, we've got a product team. In less than one year, actually. One year ago, we were three or four developers. Now we are 20 people working on the product at Arco. It's more than one people per month, one new people per month going into the team. So you have to, every month you have to ask yourself, uh, is my process good? Is everything good at the tech? And how can I improve all those processes to make my team just work better? Now we are 20 people working on the products. So first, um, we had to split uh, the tech team in two different teams. Uh, we just have two teams. Um, in each team, there is some back-end developers, mobile developers, and front-end developers. There is no like one team which is only back-end, another team which is only front-end. We already mixed everything, uh, so that's really great. Um, all the designs and all the specs are ready one week before we're starting the f new feature. feature. Um, and that really helps us to understand what the new feature is going to change on the product. So that's really cool. Um, and what's the, 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 the last part I want to say is that all the developers um, know everything about the stack. They're all working on different parts of the stack, and that's really, really um, a good point for us. We don't have one developer working on, on, on only one thing. They're all working on different things. So that's really, really cool. When someone's going on, all, on holiday, we have some other developer who can handle the job. Um, <coughs> First, um, when we were 
less than 10 people, we were working on Trello. I think maybe everyone here knows Trello. I think it's a really, really good cool tool uh, when you want to do some project management. But when you're more than 10, it's just a mess, actually. It's really fast. You can, go, you can do some good filters, but it's not better as Jira. Jira is really a pain as well. It's very, very slow. But actually, it's really, really cool when you're big teams. You can do some epics, you can do some stories, you can do what you want. It's really, really cool. So, like the two first week, we just put Jira in place at Erco. Every developer, even me, I was, we were, were like, what this shit? I want to go back to Trello. But actually, now we know how to use it, and it's really, really cool, and it's very, very efficient. Um, I want to talk also about the sprint management. We're doing a kind of Scrum Kanban method, but really personalized. Very sorry about that. Um, so we're doing some sprints of seven days. Uh, what's really important for us is when the feature is ready, we have to push it as, uh, ASAP in prod. Okay? We now have to wait the end of the sprints to push it. When once a feature is ready, we push it really as up. It's really, really important for us. Yep. Now let's talk about our architecture at Arco, the tech architecture. Um, at first, we only had one project, which is Arco Web, which is the really main project with all the models, with all the controllers, uh, with the dashboard, with all the call logic, with the API, everything. So if this project went down, all our code went down. That was really shit. So then, we just built a lot of macro services. Uh, one which is Strongbox, which is the uh, invoices system. The other one, which is live call, which is uh, the call logic and stuff. So every single services are unique and they can work on their own. Uh, if they are down, it does not impact all the all the stack. That's really important. We are not a microservices uh, architecture, we are a macro-services architecture. Um, we got four uh, different development environments. The first one is local. Um, local is when you're developing on your machine, when you're coding on your machine, so you got your own environment with your own DB. Uh, then we have our staging environment, which is um, a, like a pre-prod environment. Uh, all the product managers are using it just to make some tests. And then we got a new environment, which is internal. We've put it in place like two months ago. Um, it just all the biz guy and all the sales guys and all the customer success and the support are using these internal environments. Like they got some new codes all year than all our customers. And then we got a production environment. So we got like four different environments. So we had to ask ourselves how we can push the code faster to production. And we don't want a code to be blocked uh, in staging. Just as you know, in terms of Git, um, this is the kind of stuff we're doing. Local is uh, your branch, your own branch, like feature slash something or fix slash uh, something. Staging is our master branch. Internal is a new branch we, we've created. It's internal. And production is also a production. So the main question we ask ourselves uh, in the beginning was how we can fasten, faster, fasten, so don't, uh, the code to be pushed uh, in production. We really want uh, to have a really um, for less um, co um, flow to go to production. So we had to think about how we can make some continuous integration uh, with that team. Do you guys have any question about how the tech team works or something? It's pretty clear for everyone. It was really easy, this one. Okay, cool. Cool. You can, uh, sorry. 
What is your tech stack? Which technology do you use the server side and, uh, and front, uh, for the front end? Yeah, sure. So I'm going to talk about that later, but just to answer your question, all the back end is coded in Ruby on Rails. Uh, all the front end part is coded in AngularJS with some TypeScript code on it. Um, all our services are hosted in AWS, the Amazon services, web services. Uh, the database are in MySQL and Elasticsearch. We got some Redshift as well for the all the data analysis. That's it. And all the mobile apps are coded in native Swift and uh, Java code. So we had to build um, continuous integration for all those different pipelines and all those different projects. Um, does someone know what really continuous integration is and what for you the definition is? That's really a tough question. I'm really sure that some people try to do. Do you have any idea? Yeah, you want to say? Uh, I, will, I will try. So f first, I will make the difference between continuous integration and continuous deployment, because you, you mentioned you wanted to have uh, the things all the way to deployment. But for me, that's more than continuous integration. And so continuous integration is a capacity um, to release your code to uh, pre-production uh, in a, in a one automatic automatized process, I will say, from the developer uh, to the pre-prod with no uh, manual interaction, something like that. That's very cool. Um, I think there's there's all, uh, a lot of different definition about this, but you mentioned a really good point that continuous integration is just something, a new component of how you deploy and how you develop your products. There is, I think, three different ways. There is the continuous integration, the continuous delivery, and the continuous deployment. And I've been talking about the continuous deployment for a long time, thinking I was talking about continuous integration. And actually, it's a huge, huge difference. Those are three different topics, but they all work together. Yep. So let's start with what I think continuous integration is, is when you're taking the master branch, so the general branch where all the developers are working on, and you're taking it and just pulling it into your developer branch. So you're up to date, you have the latest code, and you make, just make sure that your code is not breaking the new branch, the master branch, okay? Uh, for me, it's that. With that, you can plug a CI, a CI a tool. Uh, sometimes it's just Circle CI, Jenkins, Travis, and stuff, uh, just to build some tests and just to be sure that your new code is not breaking anything on the master branch. Why do you want to do that? Um, mainly just to work with the latest version of master, and so the staging environment for us, and just to be sure that you're not breaking anything and you're just making some regression on your code. Um, with that, we had um, we had a new very good composants. We had a lint method, which just watching our code and just making sure that all the code is very linted and like all the CSS properties that are in the right orders, like you didn't not forget the comma, comma at the end of all sentences in JavaScript and stuff like that. Uh, so all the developers are just making the same code, and when you read code, it's really, really clear. How we do that? Uh, we just use Git, GitHub, some pull requests, pull request review, uh, and CircleCI as well. Then we need to talk about uh, continuous delivery. For me, again, for me, continuous delivery is just when, when you want to push your code ASAP in production. I think that when you write some code, um, if it's not in production, it's like dead code. It's useless code, and you wrote it uh, for nonsense. So once your code is in production, it can live in production be used by some customers sometimes. So you, you really have to focus on how you can push your code into production ASAP. Uh, the main um, concern about that is you don't want to push some new bugs in production really, really fast. So 
you have to just fit your flag all your new code. When, you're, when we are releasing a new feature at Arco, actually we're pushing the code into production, but no customer can see it and can use it. The code is in production, and it, li it lives in production. Uh, we can see if there is some regression about it, but all the customers cannot use it. Once we think the code does not impact all the stack, then we just add the feature flag in our back office on the company, and then they can start using the new feature. Like we're, we are just releasing a new feature, which is um, the um, confluence calls. Uh, we don't want to, ha uh, to, to give access to all our customers the confluence call. So we pushed the code into production like one week ago. We're just seeing how the code is like evolving uh, in the production environments. And then we're just starting to add some feature flag on some companies who can use it. So it's just like a beta version of it. Um, this kind of method, I'm not sure it's going to like reduce the number of bugs you're going to have in production, but you're just going to see really faster when you have a bug, and it's really going to be uh, easier to find where is the bug. If you're just waiting like seven days to release your new feature, you have like seven days of code in production to find well, where the bug is. So I'm not really sure that's a good way to do it. If you're going to do like two or three times a day uh, a release in production, you can really find faster where the bug is. Now, how can you do that? Um, you just have to use a really good release management tool. Uh, we're using Jira just to see uh, where are the tickets, uh, if the tickets is in production or not. And you really have to do micro releases. Uh, you do not want to be scared of pushing in production like two or three times a day, really. For that, you can use the continuous deployment. Uh, you've talked about that just before. Um, it's when you just when you're pushing into the branch, there is a new process starting, making some tests, making some linting, linting's, and then it deploys automatically on new servers. So that's the continuous deployment for me. When you're pushing to a branch, there is a new uh, process starting and then pushing the new code into your production servers. Uh, something which is quite important here is that's when you're pushing code into production, you don't want any downtime. So you have to handle that. We can see later how we do that at Arco. Um, but this is really, really cool for all our developers. If they want to push something to production, they just have to go to the branch production and then just push this branch. And then all the flow is starting magically. And then the code is pushed to production. That's really easy. They don't have to go on the servers, like SSH on the servers, pull the, the code and stuff, and re rebuild this, the app, just do it automatically. So that's, for me, the continuous deployment. How you can just do that? Uh, at Arco, we're using Capistrano on the back end, code deploy on the front end. We're going to see that later. But you also can use like bash scripts um, and other tools you, who can do it for you. If I want to sum up all of these, uh, the continuous integration is when you taking the master branch and put it in your dev branch, and then you got some tests running on it, automatic tests running on it. Then the continuous delivery is when you're pushing SAP uh, to production. And the continuous deployments is when there is a new process starting, taking your production code, putting on your um, production servers automatically. Is that clear enough for everybody, the difference? So for me, uh, when you're talking about continuous integration, actually you're talking about all those processes. There are three different processes, but they all work together. That's really important that you implement all of those together in your company. If I want to sum up everything, why are we doing that? Just to put some new tests in place, in place uh, to put some LinkedIn in place, just to uh, be sure that all your code, bye -bye, all your code is um, and just the same, uh, um, it's written the same way, it's written the same way, to prevent human error, because when you're not doing any deployment stuff by yourself, uh, then you have a machine doing it, it's pretty much sure. 
uh, make devil life easier, easier. They don't have to do DevOps stuff, and you have to prevent downtime. We're going to see that later. How you can do that? I already told you. You use GitHub, Circle CI, Travis Jenkins, and you can also use Heroku if you have enough money to use it. And when do you have to put it in place? I think you have to put it in place ASAP. Uh, we put it in place when we were two developers uh, at the really, really beginning of Hercule, and it really helped us just to scale the team. <coughs> so yeah, I told you that at Hercule we use GitHub, CircleCI, Capistrano on the backend side, and AWS Code Deploy. Um, I'm gonna dive in um, how we push to prod some front-end application at Arco, uh, because I'm mostly working on the front-end part and the, the product part. Um, so as I told you, uh, all the, the apps at Arco are written in AngularJS, uh, in TypeScript actually. They are built in Webpack with Webpack. Uh, we're using Circle CI, Code Deploy, and some Nginx servers just to push the apps to um, all our customer ends. Actually, the Nginx part is going to be replaced by some S3, S3, um, S3 repository. So what really happens when we're pushing some code to production? First, uh, we're going onto the branch production, on Git Checkout production, then we're merging the master branch into uh, the production branch, and then we just git push. That's all we're doing. That's really all we're doing. I want to show you how CircleCI works. So this is how CircleCI looks like. When we're going on the production branch, uh, we can see all the releases we've made on the Aircall phone app. Okay, So we can see that some of them have failed. If I'm going to dive in one build, then I'm going to see all the steps happening when we're pushing something to production. So really, when we're doing a git push, then CircleCI just take the leads and handle uh, some comments we're going to, uh, to tell it. So that's really how CircleCI looks like. That's okay for everyone? Cool. So first, CircleCI, I'm going to talk a bit more technical right now. So if there is any question, do not hesitate to stop me. Uh, first, CircleCI just um, start a virtual container on their server. There, uh, th this is the first uh, green item uh, on the top. The second one is they're taking the code uh, from your GitHub repository, and then they're going to try to build um, to build your app into this uh, virtual machine. Okay, so you can put a set of commands, put a set of some scripts, bash scripts, and they're going to install everything on the machine. So first, they're going to install all the dependencies. They're going to do an npm install, or maybe um, bundle install if you're in Ruby on Rails, just to get all the newest um, packages uh, of your system. Then they're going to build uh, exactly your, your um, application. Uh, so we use Webpack. Webpack take all the Angular files, uh, actually all the TypeScript files, they're building it in JavaScript, they're compiling it in JavaScript, then uh, it builds everything, all the dependency in one single package, which is like a zip file, a tarball, um, and then it keeps it away from you. Uh, then it's going to lint your code. Uh, you have to know that if there is one single error in your scripts, all the scripts are going to stop, and then your deployment is gonna, not going to happen. We had, we, we've seen just previously that we got some fail uh, in production just this afternoon, I think. If it's not okay. I don't care. Um, so if your build fails at one step, so like CircleCI cannot install something, then all the scripts stops working uh, and your deployment's not going to happen. That's really, really important. That's really the uh, development, uh, deployment, continuous development uh, is doing. Um, so then we should have some tests for this example. We don't have any tests, uh, but then you can start like your rake files on something, or spec files, and then you're going to deploy uh, the previous built zip file onto your new server. 
at Circle, on the front-end part, we're using uh, code deploy to, to use that. Up. Do you guys have any question? I think I have, like, I'm 30 minutes talking about that. Uh, if you want, I can show you how really we really do that, uh, technically speaking. But if you guys have some question, I'm cool to go in. Hello, thanks for the, for the presentation. Uh, I have a question in terms of operations. Uh, on the former slide, there were one person uh, titled with DevOps. So how do you handle the on-core uh, part? The call parts? On-core, the on-core part, is astreint. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, actually, we are pretty confident about our stack, but when uh, our DevOps wasn't here, my co-founder and I were, those as, were doing those astreints. I don't know how to say that in English. On call, on call shifts. Cool. I'm just learning something. That's cool. Um, so yeah, we're just very confident in our stack, and we're just monitoring it every time. We have some uh, new relic um, processes running on our machine, just to be sure that our machine are up every time. Do you guys have any other question? I'm not sure. I want to dive in the code because it's going to be like really boring. So don't make me do it. <laughs> Ask some question. What? Are you really all developers here? Okay, I'm just going to show you um, something. Uh, so CircleCI, how how to set up CircleCI? Can you see the screen? Maybe I can zoom in. So you've seen the different steps in CircleCI just before. Uh, the build step, the deployment step, the, text, uh, the test step. So first, CircleCI, if you want to put it in place in your product, it's really, really easy. It's just a YML uh, file, and you have to specify some, th some stuff. First, you have to specify which version of Node.js or, or Ruby or Rails or Perl and, or anything you want to use. We want to use the 6.9.4, and then you have to uh, specify the dependency step. First, we want to install some dependencies. I can... So, erase the dependencies file. It's really, really easy. You just have to npm install uh, which dependency you want, so webpack typing, TypeScript, and stuff. Uh, then you have a build file. The build file is just going to launch a webpack build, that's pretty much it, and then you can specify cache directory, which is not quite interesting. And then you have the test parts. First, in the test part, we want to lint the code, and then, as you see, have you seen, uh, there is no test on this project, but you could start uh, the web driver management and some product or tests if you want on this project, okay? Then you just have to specify a deployment uh, section, with different branch. So CircleCI is going to deploy only on the staging branch, on the beta environments, and on production. If you're pushing on another branch, uh, which is different, uh, different of those three ones, it's not going to deploy anywhere. It's just going to stop uh, at the test section. So when you're coding on your own branch, like feature or something, when you're pushing into Git uh, this branch, it's going to run all the tests, but no deployments. That's really important. Um, CircleCI integrates very, very well uh, with code deploy. Um, so I just have to put a setup, which is uh, this something which is really, really cool is the deployment configuration. Uh, actually, we have for all the, um, the front end apps, we have several servers running it. And you can specify if you want to, sh uh, during the, all those processes, if, if you want to shut down all the apps uh, in one time, or if, if you want to do it one at a time. This is really important if you want to do a uh, downtime-less uh, deployment process, uh, because you don't want your app to be down for five minutes. Uh, so you just put in these settings, and then just going to remove one instance of your servers from the load balancer, install the new packages, install the new app, 
and then put it uh, put the new version new instance on the load balancer and then you're going to do it for each instance be, uh, behind your load balancer we have i think two or three different instances for each project behind the load balancer at the uh, in, in AWS configuration. So that's pretty much it. Uh, just for circuits here, you only have to write 60, 60 lines of code, and then you have a really powerful um, um, development integration with it. I think, yeah, that's pretty much it. And I think it works the same with um, Travis and Jenkins. That's it. What yep. Um, donc j'ai trois questions. Oh, I have three questions. Sorry. Uh, you you okay with that? Yeah. Three. All right. Good. Um, go so just to go back to what you say earlier about um, your uh, three no four uh, environment. So um, it's local staging, uh, internal, and production. Uh, just to understand, is internal some sort of pre-production? Yeah, that's it. But it's going. Uh, it's using the same database as production. So all our uh, business guys and um, customer services guys are using the very latest codes they can have. And they really have just a preview of what's going to go out like next week or something for all the customers. So they can just use the product just as all our customers use it and just find some new bugs if there is some. OK, thanks. Second question, in terms of feature flagging, how are you handling? Is it the data structure that you're storing in a database or somewhere else? Yeah, actually that's really, really easy to implement. That's pretty much it. We've got a database with uh, all the, the feature, different feature flags. And when we want to add a feature on a company, we just have to add a feature to a company and then everything is handled. That's really, really easy to do. Okay, cool. Um, I have two last questions. You cool. talk about microservices. What's for you the difference between a microservice and a microservice? Is it the, the size of the code, or uh, is it uh, the number of operations you're handling? Um, once again, I think the definition is different for every company. For us, a microservice is only like one server and link one operation, one single operation. A microservice is more big uh, than the microservices. Uh, we can talk about like how we handle all the call logic at our call. Uh, this is a microservices because there is a lot of different operation in one single service, okay, on one single server or maybe two or, or more. But I think the main difference is that for me, a microservice is just handle one operation and a macro service handle several different operation and just handle a core feature of your product. All right. And um, how uh, do you make them communicate? Do you have some sort of event bus uh, with a Redis or a BitMQ, or uh, do you expose API gateway between all the services? Yeah. Um, for now, we only have APIs between all the services. Okay. They are sometimes sharing some models uh, in database. Uh, every single microservices have has this own database, but sometimes you have to share some model between each mm -hmm. other. Uh, so you need to replicate your codes in all the services, which is quite painful, but that's okay. You can live with it. Um, so yeah, just to answer your question, it's just with API between all the services. Okay. No RabbitMQ for now. All right. Thanks. Cool. Thank you for this speech. I have three questions also. Cool. Um, I wanted to know when you need to upgrade or modify the data structure, what do you do? Do you use your Circle CI uh, continuous deployment or you have a separate process? Th that's a really, really good question because the first time we did that, we've done that, everything went down because once you've updated your database model, all your machines are not really aware that your model has changed. So the first time we were like, we are really, really dumb. Uh, what the sheet are we making? So once we want to upgrade our database structure, we're just pushing the codes uh, into production just for these database changes. And then we're pushing the codes with the new models. So okay. there is two different, and we're using the deployments, the continuous deployment process. So you, uh, if I sum up, you, you push the code as well as the 
database modification. Yeah, and in, two, in two different releases. In two different releases. And I, I guess you stop the machine, you do that, and then you go to the next machine. You rotate, no? Yeah, that's it. OK. Uh, my second question was about um, the tests. When you merge a feature, when a dev merge a feature, does he run all the tests and only his local tests? No, actually, when you merge uh, the master branch into his own code, then he's going to push his own code into another new branch. And CircleCI or whatever CI tool you're using are going to, uh, is going to run all those tests. So all the tests are mainly made uh, and run on the CI platform. But you showed us that they are run on three different branches, beta, production, and master. So when somebody merges uh, a feature, mm -hmm. it runs um, on, I would say, the develop branch. Does it, does it launch the Actually, some all tests? Actually, all, no? diff uh, all the those environments are pretty much the same. It's not the same DB behind it. Yeah. But uh, all of them are really the same. When we're pushing some code to production, we're taking the code from internal. When, it, when, when we're pushing a code to internal, we're taking the, the code from masters. So all the flow is one single flow. It's not different flow going to production. I don't know if you can see what I mean. Okay. And my last question is, um, you talked about the feature database. Um, it means you activate, inactivate a feature. In it's a flag, you see? Your flag, yes. Does that mean that you know, application has a state and needs to check each time it runs, need to check whether the um, feature is activated or not? Yeah, depending on the feature, but yeah. Uh, Does it doesn't slow down the process? No, not at all. You just have to check if the Boolean is true or false, and then you're going into the code or not. Right. OK. Sounds, OK. But uh, even if it, it goes 10,000 times a day through that feature, no, that's not. That, that, that's just an if condition. Uh, if the company has this feature, then you're going deep dive into the codes and doing the feature. But if it does not, you don't want to do use it. It's, that does not slow down the process at all. Any other Thank question? You. Thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier that you also have a, a mobile app. So mm. do you do a continuous uh, delivery of the mobile app? No. <laughs> the, okay. reference, the answer is no. Uh, we only do uh, continuous integration, so with some tests uh, on those apps. But when we want to deploy those apps into the stores, we have to do it manually. No, I, I, I was talking delivery, not deployment. Oh, delivery, yeah. Um, Actually, no, because uh, when you want to push uh, a code, in, in, for the mobile apps, it's quite different, but because when you push a code into production, you have to build the release for everyone. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you don't do this release, the code is not uh, in the production environment. You see what I mean? Okay. So you have to build the, your, your, your app and put it on some servers to, to have this. But so you, you could use Circle CI to build an app and test it on top of the oh. production or internal. Yeah, okay. Sorry, I didn't understand your question. So we're doing it for Android. We're not doing it for iOS. Uh, every time our Android developer is pushing something onto a branch, it's going to build an APK file that we can download on our phones. Okay. Uh, I got another question. When we are, you are growing your team, you had to put some more processes and, and, and more structure to, to assure the quality of your, your code. So two questions concerning your code review policy. Uh, do you require code review and protect your branches during pull requests? And the other question, do you have also a code coverage policy to require a, a minimal code coverage for unit tested? Or? Yeah, OK. Uh, so first question. There is no one single line of code going to master uh, if it hasn't been reviewed by at least two different developers. So for each single feature, each single bug fix, you have to be reviewed uh, by two different developers. That is really important. And for that, GitHub is really a good tool just to put some reviewers on your pull requests, and you can approve or reject a pull request. So that's really, really cool. We are re really using that as a powerful tool of our stack. 
Second question was code coverage. Yeah, uh, we have a code coverage policy on the backend part because that's the main main part of our call. If the call logic is down, then we fucked up. So at least it's like 90% uh, of all the code code base of backend is tested. Um, I, I wanted to ask, how do you, um, what's your code review process like? Okay. Um, actually, I can show you if you want. I think I got some pull requests open. Um, if I'm going to GitHub, we got this project, Aircall Phone, which is the main uh, Aircall application, uh, which with one you can make some calls and receive calls. So if, you, if I'm going to pull requests, I can see there is some eight pull request opens. Uh, if I'm going to this one, I can see that Damien opened this one like two hours ago. He requested a review by three developers. He put a description on it, how to test it, and then he have to follow a process before submitting his pull, review, pull request, okay? He have to be sure that his branch is based on master. He have to be sure before pull, uh, uh, putting his uh, pull request, the circle CI is built is green, like everything is good and all the tests passed. Uh, he has to be sure that his uh, pull request is naming named just like a Jira ticket, and maybe like two different devs are uh, associated to this pull request. So I'm going to like browse all the codes, and we're just using GitHub as uh, like everyone else. We, if I'm not agree with that, I will put something a comment. We can start a review, just as add as many comments on this review, and then put a comment approve or request changes on this pull request. Then it's going to be notified and have to make all those changes before uh, pushing his new code to master. If there is two developer approving this pull request, then the developer is in charge of putting his code into master. All right. Thank you. Sure. Uh, moi j'ai une question, je vais faire en français, c'est possible. Yes. Uh, comme je suis pas développeur, je suis un peu, je suis pas aussi uh, avancé que les autres. En fait, c'était pour venir sur Circle CI, ça vous permet de mettre du, du code en production, mais seulement pour certains clients, pour, le, pour pouvoir le tester sur un petit environnement. C'est bien ça euh, Alors en fait, ça nous permet juste de mettre du code en production. D'accord. Uh, Circle CI, c'est un outil d'intégration continue, CI, ouais. uh, Continuous Integration. Et en fait, par dessus ça, ils ont aussi rajouté la composante de déploiement continu. Mais à la base, c'est juste un outil euh, qui va juste servir à faire des tests déportés de ta machine, en gros, d'accord Pas runner les tests sur ta machine tout le temps, parce que ça peut prendre un peu de temps. C'est juste lorsque tu vas mettre du code à disposition sur une nouvelle branche Git, sur un nouvel environnement, ouais. CircleCI va prendre le relais, va récupérer ton code, copier le code en fait sur ta machine, et commencer à exécuter tous les tests sur cette machine déportée. Et à la fin de ça, il va dire, ok, c'est vert, tu peux y aller, tu peux continuer ton... Ton, ton, ton flot de déploiement, ou alors c'est rouge, un des tests n'est pas passé, arrête de suite, et la branche n'est pas prête en fait. D'accord, mais j'ai cru comprendre aussi que vous testiez le code sur certains, enfin pas sur toute votre totalité de clients, c'est ça Exact. Mais ouais. alors, ce que je comprends pas, c'est que, est-ce que vous êtes sûr que le client va trigger le, la nouvelle fonction Vous n'allez pas laisser passer, euh, par exemple, un client que vous pensez qu'il va utiliser une fonction, qu'il ne l'utilise pas, et puis qu'il y a un problème qui arrive plus tard quand vous mettez le code en production pour la totalité des clients Vous n'avez pas peur qu'il y ait des bugs qui restent euh, Comment on pouvait tester et savoir que la nouvelle fonction a bien été utilisée pour, euh, par ces clients-là en fait Alors en fait les clients on les connaît, euh, on est une petite boîte, on a à peu près 3000 entreprises qui nous utilisent, ça fait euh, entre 20 000 et 30 000 utilisateurs quotidiens d'Arcol. Ces personnes-là on les connaît donc lorsqu'on réalise une nouvelle feature, on sait qu'ils la veulent, on, on sait quel client veut cette feature-là, typiquement le transfert d'appel, on va savoir que tel et tel client le veulent, donc on va les appeler, on va leur dire Ok, on est en train de développer le truc, par contre on a besoin d'un coup de main pour tester. Ils sont souvent très ouverts à tester des, des fonctionnalités en avant, en avant première. Et ils sont prêts même à débugger avec nous les features. Ouais, donc après ils vous donnent donc, un feedback, coup, exactement. Etc. Ils, en fait ils sont au courant qu'on va leur pousser une feature, on ne la pousse jamais sans, sans dire à personne. Après ce qui est assez intéressant avec cette notion de feature flag, c'est que lorsqu'on va vouloir release la fonctionnalité à tous les clients, on va pouvoir le faire petit à petit. On va prendre 25% des clients, un peu en mode aléatoire, et on va release la feature pendant... 3-4 jours, on va voir si la feature évolue bien dans le, dans le monde de la production, s'il n'y a pas de bug, s'il n'y a pas quoi que ce soit, et si jamais on voit que ça se passe bien, alors on pousse à 50%, 75%, puis 100%. Merci. 
question. Well, my question, my question is not a technical one, but uh, you're saying that you're doing a lot of um, uh, deployments uh, as soon as you can. How do you keep your uh, commercial team, your sales team, and your support team up to date with all these features you're releasing? Yeah. So as every startup, we're using Slack. Uh, we got a channel which is changelog, and every day at 7 p.m., I post a full changelog on what's happening in production to customers. So when we're releasing a new feature to customers, but which is hidden because there is a feature flag, I'm not telling the biz guy that the feature is available. I'm just saying that, hey, maybe if you want to try this feature, just ask me and I will just allow this feature on, on this client, on this customer. Uh, but they, yeah, we got a channel on Slack called ChangeLog, and every day at 7 p.m. I put everything going to, pro, uh, to production. Does this is a, a manual step you're doing? Yeah, because all the commits you've written are really, really technical, and your biz guy not going to understand anything about what you're saying, so you have to translate everything in a biz term. That's why the API webhooks uh, question in the interview process is really, really important for us. That's because we, you every day have to explain uh, what you're doing at our call as a developer. Okay, thank you. Another question? Yes. Just to come back on one of your last uh, points, uh, you said that um, when you release actually to the customers, you do it with a sample first, then with more uh, customers. Uh, do you use another one out of the box solution or did you have to develop as a way to do it by yourself? You mean the feature flag? Uh, yeah, to actually release um, um, sample after sample of users. Yeah, actually, that's quite a pain today for us because we have to develop to develop uh, the blocking of the feature. Uh, we have to add a new entry in the, the database when we're releasing a new feature. Like, uh, let's talk about the conferencing. We don't want to release the conferencing to everyone, so we have to add a new entry as a new feature, uh, beta feature in our database. And then, in the front-end part, we have to hide all the buttons, all uh, the codes for the users who does not have this kind of feature. That's quite a pain, pain but you have to do it if you want uh, your code to be stable after. Okay. The last one. Cool. Thank you very much. All the questions were really, really good. That was really cool for me. Thank you, Xavier. So, thanks. Thank you for your time and for sharing all these tips with the audience. Now, if you want to, you, you know, keep uh, exchanging, we have a few, few more beers in the fridge. And so please uh, feel free to do so. Thanks. Merci. Merci.